Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, and this is Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach of the Punahou School Boys Varsity Tennis Team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my books, Beyond the Lines and Beyond the Game, and it's about inspiration, welcoming adversity, and building a superior culture of excellence. My special guest today is a world-renowned pianist who was featured in the movie with Elvis Presley. She is Ginny Tew, and today we are going beyond the piano. Hey, Ginny, welcome to Beyond the Lines. Hi, Rusty. Thank you so much. I'm Looking forward to this. Ginny, you have done so much throughout your life, but I want to start in the beginning. Can you share briefly about your early years with your family? Sure. Uh, I was born in the Philippines, in Manila, of Chinese her uh, descent. But my, uh, I'm from a family of nine children. Uh, the last two children were born in this country. And uh, when I was uh, three and a half years old, I really was so fascinated. My dad played the piano and uh, he was a businessman, though. He was not a, a professional pianist, but there was always music in our home. And I just loved it, even at a young age. Uh, so, you know, that's uh, I grew up just with surrounded by um, family, siblings and music. So, Ginny, you became a child prodigy with the piano. And you said right there that your dad had started, the, you know, playing the piano. How did, how did you really get started and, and then really to get interested and then excel with it? Well, my dad would actually lock the piano uh, because there were seven of us at the time. Uh, and, you know, the youngest was like barely a year old running around. We were just uh, a very, you know, we were kids, right? And we'd want to get on the piano and he was afraid we would just bang on it. It was this precious piano. So he would lock it. We never got to get on it. He would just play it when uh, he was able to and we would enjoy him playing, but we couldn't get to the piano. And uh, one day he rushed out and didn't lock the piano. And it was our mother who heard me playing. And when he came home, uh, she said to him, I think you need to listen to her because I am hearing something different. It's not just kids banging on it and noise, but I, heard, I hear her really trying to play music because that's what I was. I was very serious about it. Even at three and a half years old, I was fascinated uh, listening to my dad and hearing this beautiful sound coming out of this piece of furniture, basically. I didn't know what piano was. I mean, I just thought it was a piece of furniture. And uh, so I really tried to pick out, pluck out things that I heard him playing and just simple, of course, but I was trying to duplicate what I had heard him playing. And so when he started, he said, okay. And he started showing me, of course, my hands are like this, right? Tiny, tiny, I'm three and a half years old. So he had to make it very simple, but anything he played, I would come back and play it. And then he realized that he could teach me that there was potential. And of course he was thrilled because he loves the piano. So to think that there was somebody that he could share this with, uh, was, he was made him very happy. <laughs> Wow, that's that's so interesting how he had the piano locked and then he left it out, left it unlocked that one day. And that's kind of how it all started. And Ginny, right. back in the day, the Ed Sullivan show was super, super popular. How how was your experience being on the Ed Sullivan show? Well, of course, at that time, I was five years old and uh, I didn't really, I don't think, appreciate the meaning of it, the depth of it. I just really enjoyed playing. And of course, to hear people applauding and, uh, you know, saying you play well, of course that, you know, everybody enjoys that. So I, I did enjoy that, uh, just playing really. 
I love playing. I, uh, and then just to also find out that Ed Sullivan initially, you know, he's very stern. He comes across that way, but he was so nice. He was actually very nice. Wow. No, that's that's incredible because that just really opened a lot of doors and really gave you so much publicity. And Ginny, I want to ask you about the movie that you're in with the great Elvis Presley. I mean, Elvis is my mom's favorite of all time. And I want to I want to know how did how did that movie come about? And then what was Elvis like behind the scenes? Colonel Parker uh, contacted my dad and uh, I was eight years old at the time and said, you know, I have this role and I'd like to have Ginny in this movie with Elvis. And uh, so, you know, that's how that was girls, girls, girls. And so I did that movie with Elvis and he was just so kind, Rusty, so humble, soft-spoken. Uh, if I messed up my lines, he would say, and I said, I'm so sorry, so sorry, Mr. Presley, so sorry, everybody. And he would say, honey, don't worry about it. We all do that. And instead of getting uh, upset, he was very patient. He was very generous. Uh, just a really wonderful person behind the scenes. It was a joy to work with. I just, you know, I was thrilled to work with him. Wow. I mean, not too many people can say that they spent time with Elvis Presley, uh, let alone being in a movie with him. And Ginny, you performed for one of our presidents, President John F. Kennedy. How did that come about? And tell me about that experience. Yes, he was, again, also just very, uh, it was a real honor, of course. Uh, but there's a, a story behind that, because uh, I was asked to do another movie with Elvis. Uh, I don't know if you know that, Rusty, and that, that was going to be at the same time. And so that was, it happened at the World's Fair, and I could not do that. I was so disappointed when I heard my dad tell Colonel Parker that, I'm sorry, but Ginny can't do this movie. Uh, and uh, so instead, Vicky did that movie. And so, of course, that turned out fabulous. She did a terrific job. But uh, President Kennedy was just also, you know, I was nine by that time. Uh, and he was very, very kind also, very nice. I remember um, my mom wanting to take a photo of us with the president. And this is with my other sister, Liz, and brother Al. And Vicky, unfortunately, couldn't do that because she was doing the movie with Elvis. Uh, and, you know, she wanted to get close, of course. And, of course, the security said, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, you can't go through there. And I told the president, I said, oh, that's my mom. And he said, of course, come on in, come on in. You know, and uh, so we were able to get a Nice shot, a close-up shot. And then he said, oh, I wish, you know, uh, uh, Carolyn, because I'm about the same age, I think, as Carolyn Kennedy, and uh, wish that, you know, she could have seen you as well. And uh, just said that you, you play so well. You know, it was such an honor, really such an honor. Wow. That's, I mean, <laughs> I love hearing these insights. Um, and, well, it's too bad you couldn't be in, that second movie with Elvis, but at yeah. least Vicky was able to be in it. And um, yeah. you, you mean there's only one Ginny? I thought there were like five Ginnies. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, it was, yeah, I, I have to say I was disappointed at first because not being able to do the second movie. And at nine years old, I think uh, having already done the move, the first movie and knowing how wonderful and kind Elvis was, uh, I, I just didn't understand really how what an honor it was until, of course, afterwards. Now, as an adult, I'm thrilled that I got to do both play for the president, uh, for President Kennedy, and then also do the movie. Uh, I'm just very, very thankful. I thank God really all the time for the many opportunities I've had. Yes, definitely. And Ginny, 
uh, Liberace, world famous pianist. At one point in time, he was the highest yeah. paid entertainer in the world. And you knew <laughs> Liberace. Yeah. Tell, tell me about him and what you admired about him. I think, of course, his obvious talent. Uh, and again, he was very nice. And I appreciate it also that I didn't realize until a little later what a great pianist he really was. I mean, because I saw him, uh, as most of us did, uh, in Vegas and performing. And his showmanship was incredible, of course. And that's what, you know, he was so known for. And that's what filled the rooms. Uh, but then when I listen to some of his earlier recordings. He is a uh, fantastic concert pianist, a uh, classical pianist, but he realized that in order to take it to another level, he re, uh, remarketed, I guess, himself. And uh, so it, I really came to appreciate what a great pianist he was, not just a piano player, that was a great showman because I used to think sometimes, well, he would play a little and then the orchestra would come in and do a lot, you know? Uh, and so I wasn't, I didn't really quite appreciate, I don't think uh, until I learned later uh, and listened to his earlier recordings, what a really great pianist he was. Well, Liberace, I mean, as I was growing up, I mean, he really set the standard. I mean, it was amazing to see him perform on TV and and to just really hear the insights that that you knew him and just wow, I mean, he was he was a performer. And Ginny, I wanna ask you about my books. You you have I feel so grateful that you have the books and I want to know, did you like it? And if so, what stood out to you in it? I loved it, Rusty. <laughs> I, you know, I, I heard, I know about you, of course, and that you're a motivational speaker and a coach. And, but then when I read your books, I, I couldn't put it down, really. I was so drawn to it because you speak what I believe in so much. You're so articulate, too, in how you put, put it, uh, wrote your books so that every, anybody can relate to it. I love that. You know, I love that anybody really and everybody can relate to it because we all have uh, struggles. We all have things that, uh, you know, one step forward, two or three steps back, right? And we all have to deal with that. And to read how you encourage people and that you, the other thing I really appreciate is that you are wanting to coach the whole person, not just to win a game or a sport in a sport or a business deal, but you want to, and this is what I really believe in, you want to not just make smarter people or more successful people, but better people, people that want to help others and that want to see other people succeed and that find joy and realize that that's real success. That's true success when you can help others uh, and not just yourself. And we need so much more of that. We need so much more of you, Rusty, and your coaching and your, your words, really, of uh, guidance, inspiration. Uh, I, I just really believe every time I, mean, I was nodding my head so many times as I was reading it. I know that. And, you know, jotting down notes because it's just, I really believe in what you had to, uh, had to share. I think it's so important too. The, and I'm so grateful that you wrote these books because it's so much needed in this world, in this day and age where it is, a lot of it is about me, really. And, you know, that that just doesn't do it. That doesn't make a better world. And we live in the same world. So if the world is a better place, it's going to be better for us as well. And I'm just thrilled. 
uh, that you wrote those books, Rusty. I can't wait to read your third book. Well, Is that coming out soon? Ginny, <laughs> Ginny, you know, it's hard to write a book. <laughs> I understand. But I'm working on book number three. I, I'm so happy that you enjoyed the books. And yeah, I'm trying to inspire the world. And I like that you brought up that I'm trying to help coach the the whole person, you know, not just a part of a person. And really, really about it's about inspiration, like you said. And you have been somebody that have have been inspiring so many others. You've created a superior culture of excellence that I talk about in the books. And I also talk about mindset and what was your mindset like when you were traveling the world performing? Well, you know, I think I've, I'm a very focused uh, person because my dad, uh, he reminded me later as an adult because people would always come up to me and say, wow, when you play, it looks like you don't even have to look. You don't look at the keys. You don't, I don't read music. So there's, I don't, I'm not reading music. Uh, I play by ear and you just, you know, just, it's just like automatic for you. And my dad was the one who reminded me, he said, huh, I'm glad that, that it comes across that way. But, you know, you were, he was so strict. My dad, once he knew that he could teach me and that I had this gift uh, from God and he had me practicing four hours a day at four years old, from four years old. And uh, I, I don't remember that part. I know that he was strict. I know I practiced a lot. I know that I wanted to also play with my siblings. And uh, he would say, no, you know, you have to practice. And uh, so I grew up really knowing that, understanding that uh, it takes discipline. It takes, uh, it, it, there's no free lunch. Uh, and if you want to have something, you have to go for it and you have to commit yourself to it and be willing to put the time and effort into it. Uh, of course, God always has to make the first move and give the gift. And then it's for us, though, to uh, work at it. And so growing up, I, I knew that much, that there are consequences to all our choices. You don't want to practice, you're not going to play well. You know, you just can't have both. I, so I grew up knowing, understanding consequences to our choices. But I also am very grateful that, you know, being able to travel and see the world and not just read about it. People uh, often ask me, uh, in fact, in an interview, I was once asked, do you feel deprived because you didn't have a, re a normal or somebody corrected me, an average childhood. Sure, I never got to go to school. I was tutored all my life. I never went to a prom. I never, you know, a lot of things I didn't get to do. Uh, but then I think, Rusty, again, they're all, you can't have it all. And when I think that I got to see places and meet people that most people only read about or hope to, hope to do, I'm so grateful. I wouldn't change it for anything. And then I also got to see how so many people live in other parts of the world. And that really touched me and uh, made me feel like, you know, I've been supporting uh, through Compassion and World Vision for the past over 40 years, uh, underprivileged or underserved children. Uh, and that's because I saw them in these countries and I wanted to do something. And so I've been doing that. And then of course I discovered animals <laughs> and I'm doing that now with animals. Ginny, it's incredible, you, you know, the experiences that, that you have got to live. And um, just a few weeks ago, you received a very prestigious award. Um, you received the Ellis Island Medal of Honor. Um, and the award really embodies the spirit of America. Tell me about how that made you feel receiving that award. And, and I felt so happy to know that you received it and you're, you know, you live here in Hawaii. 
again, I, I was so honored when I received the letter from the chairman himself uh, explaining, you know, what the award is about. Uh, it's international, you know, so people from all over the world and from different, I love that, that it's from different, uh, whether it's the arts or medical uh, uh, scientists, engineers, attorneys, entrepreneurs, uh, music. I mean, it's just from, you know, the land. And mo all of it is because what the criteria is, is that people, these people have given back to their community and then to their country and then also to our country here. And that's why it's on Ellis Island, because, Rusty, we are all immigrants uh, or from immigrant parents or grandparents. Uh, and when you hear the stories of these people, so successful now, many, many men actually were started to cry with a lump in their throat. Uh, and they're really at the top of their field. But they talked about the humble beginnings of their grandparents, starting off with nothing, coming to this country, you know, foreign country, really. But knowing that believing that this country was the, the land of opportunity. And, and then, you know, to really make, see that happen, right? In to wanting their children and their grandchildren to do better. And, you know, this is what this country has given us. So, so very grateful, really so very grateful, all of us to be there and to share our stories, met some very interesting people. Uh, and, you know, everybody was just so wonderful and wanting to share uh, about their gratitude and uh, their background. Well, Ginny, that was, I mean, it, it's such a priceless honor. I feel so happy for you to, to receive it. I mean, so well-deserved. And briefly earlier, you mentioned dogs. I, I want to ask you about why you have such a passion for dogs. I have a passion for dogs. You take the passion to the <laughs> highest level. You love dogs and all animals. And you also sponsored the Ginny Tu spay and neuter community. Can you tell me more about your passion and the community center? Absolutely. I joined the, uh, well, it started actually, I was just visiting uh, the Hawaiian Humane Society, because somebody uh, had asked me to help with uh, one of the uh, fundraisers. And it was held at, the meeting was held on site uh, on the campus. Uh, and so I was there and I saw all of these animals and I didn't really understand <laughs> what it was about. I, I thought it was a boarding facility. Uh, and when I asked the CEO at the time, Pam Burns, what, what all these animals were doing here, uh, she looked at me. It took a little while. I think she didn't know if I was joking or if she should really answer that. And when I didn't I, I laugh about it, she told me, she said, you know, these animals are here because they need a home. They are either strays or they are, uh, you know, uh, People have surrendered them for some reason. And my heart just broke. I just knew that I wanted to help them. These animals really have don't get to make a choice like people do. They don't get to make a choice and they live with the choices that humans make for them. And so I wanted to help and I got involved. I've been on the board now for 14 years. And uh, I really believe that spay and neuter is one of the most is the most humane way of controlling pet overpopulation. And so I wanted to get that built. I sponsored that, got that built. And now we're out in West Oahu. We've just opened our new campus there. Uh, it's fantastic. Would love to give you a tour, Rusty. It's just wonderful because we know how many people and animals are in West Oahu. And we want to be uh, more accessible to them. Uh, the Humane Society has, we're celebrating 140 years this year. I was started by Pinkalakawa and other royalties, actually knowing 
uh, how much the animals need our help. Well, Ginny, you and your sister, Vicky Cayetano, I mean, you both of you have been huge supporters of the Hawaii Humane Society and huge supporters of the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. I mean, tell me more. Definitely. Well, uh, Vicky and I are both on the board of the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. As of course, music has been our life, right? Has been so much a part of our life. And, you know, music uh, is so important. It isn't just entertainment. Uh, if you think about it, Rusty, so many of our young people are taught by these musicians, uh, world class musicians. Uh, they teach our young people uh, music. And music is such an important part in the community, in one's life. It brings people together. I always say animals and music are such a positive impact in one's life and in, in a community in the world, really. Uh, if people are humming or singing a tune or even whistling, even though they may, maybe they can't really, but yeah, they're happy, they're smiling. So music really brings people together. I knew that when I traveled the world and didn't speak their language, and many of them didn't speak English, but when I played, we all came together. Everybody was happy and we need more of that. So I really believe that, you know, when you believe in, in a nonprofit, we can't just applaud them. We really have to step up and support them because it's not sustainable. Our applause is important, but it's not enough. And I'm also on the board of uh, our UH Foundation Board of Trustees because I believe education is key to everything that we need to do. We need to have people knowing what to do to help uh, the community and each other. Well, Vic, uh, Vicky, that's <laughs> Ginny, okay. People Ginny, you and Vicky, I mean, I, I absolutely, I, I'm impressed with Vicky as well, and she knows yes. that, and yes. I'm super impressed by you. Um, I'm her biggest the, fan. <laughs> the impact that you both have been making in our community is priceless. And really, you know, I'm trying to make an imp a positive impact in the world. Uh, you have been doing that all your life. And I, I feel so happy to have been able to spend some time on you on the show today. Thank you, Rusty. Thank you so much. And, you know, for sharing, that is a joy to give back and to help each other. Thank you. Thank you, Ginny. And thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. For more information, please visit RustyKomori.com. And my books are available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I hope that Ginny and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.